record and we're ready. Check, check. Yeah, these mics are these yeah, mics these are, are good. good. Hey guys, I'm here today with Pat Grace. Um, Pat Grace and his wife, Marta Grace, started Grace Real Estate Investment Company about 14 years ago. And they specialize in creating an investment network group for investors who want to get plugged into the Kansas City market. So if you're interested in that, check them out. Um, Pat grew up in Hawaii. And uh, after, after bouncing around a little bit, he ended up in Kansas City. Uh, he spent time playing professional arena football and he was a juvenile probation officer and he transitioned from that he and his wife got into the investment business and in 2007 he had acquired over a hundred properties and in a stroke of genius and luck maybe a little bit of luck in there a lot of luck <laughs> he uh, he sold out about 90 doors in 2007 at the height of the market and so he missed the 08 downturn and he was sitting pretty with some cash and ready for the rebound. And since then, he and his wife, uh, Marta Grace, they have acquired over 200 doors and set up Grace Real Estate Investment Company. Yeah. So, Pat, I, I appreciate you joining me today and uh, giving us a chance to share your awesome story with, with all of our crowd. Um, you, your story is truly, it's the all-American success story. And so how did you, you started out in Hawaii. How'd you end up in Kansas City? So from Hawaii, I, um, I got a football scholarship to um, college in Iowa. Went to a division two school in Iowa, played four years out there. And then my last two years were, uh, my wife actually, well, nursing school was in Graceland College in Independence, Missouri. And so that's what brought us to Independence or Kansas City, and we, uh, you know, we, I was, I, my degree was in criminal justice, sociology, so I started doing the casework thing, and I was, you know, working as a juvenile probation. My job was to get the kids out of the facility and back into the streets, and kind of just being their probation officer. So I had to set them up with housing, I had to set them up with jobs, um, employment, and I had to do all their, their tests and you know just making sure they were all right. And in doing that, that's really when I got familiar with the Kansas City market and how cheap things were. I ran into a couple investors who were buying these big five bedroom homes off Paseo and Troost. And they were, I would, they, they would tell me they was buying them for like 30 grand and they was putting 30, 40,000 into them. And then I, they was turning them into group homes and the city or the county was paying like $700, $800 a room back then. And so I was filling those houses with, you know, kids who didn't have a place to stay. And um, the economics just, I was like, man, I need to do what these guys are doing. Like they were, they were making, you know, $3,500 a house and they're, they're all in, their basis was not even 100000 and so I was like, man, and they own the properties. And I was like, this is smart. And that's when I first realized, you know, how cheap real estate was in the Midwest. Like coming mm -hmm. from Hawaii, my wife's from LA. Um, man, you, you can't touch anything for $30,000. That's like taxes you know, on properties. <laughs> so it's, it's like, I couldn't, I couldn't fathom the fact that you could buy, and not even, not even a, these are five bedrooms, you know, 3,500 yeah. square foot homes for 30 grand back in the day. And so that's where, you know, that's what got me intrigued and got me thinking. And then like, I was sitting here feeding my son and, uh, this commercial comes on, and back in the day, it was Carlton Sheets. I don't know if you remember. Okay. How, no. how old are you? Uh, Thirty-four. Oh man, young. Okay, so <laughs> so back in the day, it was this guy Carlton Sheets, and his his program was called No Down Payment, and he was on TV, and it's like, you want to be rich, and, and they got the yachts and the Lambos and the you know all of it, and it's like, 
come to our seminar, blah, blah, this and that. So I was like, shit, hell yeah, I want to be rich. And so I'm sitting here feeding my son, and I, 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 I go to the um, seminar or whatever, and it was actually like a Trump University type deal mm -hmm. where um, I sat there and listened, it was free. And then I end up getting, a, I end up paying like $2,500 for a mentor to kind of teach me what to do. And, and like, was it worth it? Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, the, they gave you these tasks and like, so I'm really dating myself now, but you know, it's like, go to the newspaper and you got to call 15 classified ads a day. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, the newspaper is where everybody would put their real estate and sell their real estate. No Google no, back then. No Google, no internet. And so there was no email, you know, I mean, it was like phone book and, um, and classified ads. So, you know, they gave me these tasks and I, I had to do this task, I had to do that, I had to do this. And then, so I ended up finding a fourplex and, mm -hmm. and that was the strategy. They told me the strategy, the first thing you want to buy is a fourplex. You can get four units, you can rent out three units, you can get a single family loan, um, you can get good rates, you can get 30 year term. And so low down payment, I think back then was like three, it's still three and a half percent. And then I had a first time home buyer pro, so only, I actually bought like 1% to the table to get into this house. And uh, I ended up, the fourplex we bought was in Sugar Creek, Missouri. Mm -hmm. um, it had three really nice units and one unit had like no kitchen floor, it was just all floor joists and like, and so, my wife, uh, we, me and my wife moved in to that shitty unit Smart. and we rented out the other three. We put a for rent sign in the yard, no application, no nothing. You just, you want to rent? Come on. <laughs> like, Knock on the door. Uh, yeah, I just looked at you and I just said, they got good character, I'm going to rent to them. And so, <laughs> and I, I ended up, you know, I was owner occupied, you know, so like I lived there. So like they couldn't really trash the place. They couldn't, you know, if they wasn't paying, I could, yeah. you know. And, so and living next to a guy like you, you're playing arena football back then, yeah, right? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're not gonna go tear the place up too bad living next door to Pat. No, and, and so it was good. I mean, we, man, we sat, I bought that place for $80,000. Uh, I rented each unit for 750. So, you know, I was getting in about two grand, 2,100 bucks. And my payment back then was like 600, $700. So it was cash flowing. I lived rent free. And that's when, you know, I got the taste of like, okay, maybe this casework stuff isn't for me. Like I was making $35,000 a year doing juvenile probation and parole and I had a degree, you know, and, and, and so I quickly went and got my real estate license. I worked for Century 21 back in the day for a couple of years and um, started getting into uh, real estate, you know, and at that point I had access to the houses, mm -hmm. but I didn't have access to money. And so I was going around looking for cash and money and every, all the banks were like, man, you're 21, you're young, you've got no experience, you've got no assets, um, you know, you've got no cash. So somebody turned me on to Bernie, one of these bankers turned uh -huh. me on to I was like, hey, you need to call this guy Bernie. What year would have that been? So that would have been, I graduated 99. That would have been maybe 2000, 2001. Okay. And so um, I met Bernie and right on North Oak off of 72nd right there. And um, that guy did everything for me. Like he gave me my first rehab loan mm -hmm. um, and I still remember the address was 8626 Morrell in Independence. That was my first rehab project, my first deal. Um, Bernie financed it, and man, I, I messed up that whole deal. How so? What, what happened? So like the first, like I gave the contractor 50% down, I never seen him again. Ouch. So the first thing out, out the gate, I was 20 in the hole. Ugh. Like I gave him 20 grand, never seen that guy again and uh, that really hurt and so uh, now I'm trying to play catch up so I'm start. I'm trying to do all this work that I don't know what I'm doing mm -hmm. you know and I'm I bought this book from Home Depot the orange uh, <laughs> Home Depot book and like you know back in the day we didn't have YouTube 
You didn't have that. So you're like, you're sitting here reading how to lay tile yeah. and how to and put in windows and shit, you know? And so it's like, it was just, and then like, after that, you don't trust anybody and you're just like, all the subs you're getting, they, they come for a little while and then they leave. And it was just, it was just difficult. And I was still playing football. And so I had a six month loan with Bernie, my first deal ever with him. And I had to extend for three months I had to pay the interest, and um, and I so I had to do all this, and like it was just tough. I finally I finally got the house done, and with all, and got it sold. And back in the day, it was a little bit easier than it is now. You know, back in the day, you could sell a house to a four hundred fifty credit score with a hundred percent finance. Like if you couldn't exit out of your real estate, you're an idiot. Like it wasn't like yeah. it is today where everybody needs a down payment. And back in the day, the money was just flying around. It was so easy to get in and out of paper. And so I uh, I sold that house and with all the mistakes, I made 10 grand. And I was like, man, if I just focused on this 100% and I didn't have all these distractions, I think I would kill it. Yeah. And so at that point, my wife's now graduating she's a spanish speaking nurse she got hired by some rich white guy who had all the blue cross blue shield contracts and had no spanish speaking labor and delivery so she she was doing home health and he paid her like almost 65 70 thousand dollars back in the day that was a lot of money mm -hmm. for a new nurse but she could travel she you know spoke spanish and he had all these blue cross blue shield contracts and had no nobody and so she was making two times the amount of money that I was making. And I was like, man, I'm quit, I quit, I quit my job. I just quit and said, I'm gonna do real estate full time. And, and, then, just, it, and then it took off. Yeah. How, how, did, how did it take off? How did you get that momentum? So like, no, and, and, then, and then what happened is I ran into another guy named Brent uh, who was doing a lot of fraud and a lot of stuff. And so that stalled me out for almost a couple years. Well, yeah, I mean, that, I mean, when I say take off, like, I, you know, after that first deal, I did like maybe, I don't know, 10 more deals with Bernie and I was doing the, the rehabs and I was, you know, flipping homes and I was keeping homes and this and that. And then I ran into this deal with this Brent Barber guy who, did a whole bunch of fraud and really set me back. But when I look back on it, it was the, the best mistake I made because it really got me into the area of finance. Uh -huh. So like, I was like, man, I got screwed over by this loan officer and he did all this fraud and they needed all this stuff. The attorneys needed all this stuff. I had to get some guys to go into his office and wheel out like file cabinets. So, <laughs> you know, I was like, you're not gonna screw me over on seven homes and just, okay you know like the attorney was like i need paper they didn't want to give me my file so i went in there with some guys and we two guys against the wall and we hand trucked <laughs> all their file cabinets and put them Did in you my get what you need? oh yeah not only i got what my need i got i found 350 homes and over 40 investors that were screwed the way i was it was oh a whole gosh. scheme they oh was running God. and then and so we hired we all hired the same attorney it's a two-year process now. There's a two-year process that all this it took, and and my credit went to shit. I couldn't finance anymore. I couldn't get loans. I couldn't do end loans anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I had the knowledge of where to go to get the end loans. So while I was doing those ten homes, the first ten, Bernie came to me and was like, Pat, how the hell are you paying these houses off so fast? <laughs> you know, like I'll be in them for a month and then refinance them and I was using the appraised value, no seasoning on title, just, all, you know, and, and I was like, shit, Bernie, if I told you that, you wouldn't need me, just send all them people to me. <laughs> and so he handwrites a legal, <laughs> he handwrites a, a legal size paper with probably 30, 40 investors and their phone numbers, front and back, uh -huh. and I called the front only. And after I called the front, I had about 60 loans in my pipeline. Oh, just from, yeah. And so changed my life. Like f from that day forward, just in the loan business, I was making two grand to three grand a loan and I was doing all of Bernie's end loans. And so I was like the end loan, I had this niche mm -hmm. and I was like the end loan guy in Kansas City. So from that day forward, I've never not made 
50 grand a month. You know what I mean? I started making 50,000, 50. And I was just refinancing all his clients. And then, so that kind of took me and got me through the lawsuit, you know, because I couldn't buy anything. I couldn't do anything because of my credit. And so we ended up suing the banks. We ended up winning. The banks had to put all the transactions aside because they were all fraud. And we sued their underwriting departments for letting this guy submit fraudulent W-2s uh -huh. and paying all that stuff. So anyway, yeah, so... So um, so now my, my credit's back. Uh, they set all the foreclosures aside. My credit's back to 800. I'm making 50,000 a month doing loans and I've got access to all this capital. And now I know how to package up paper. I know how to sell paper. I know how to, I, I got my real estate license. So now I had access to capital and I had access to product, to houses. And so I just started buying a shit ton and I was using Bernie to do all my rehab loans and I was the end loan guy. So I was refinancing my own paper at three and a half, four percent on wow. 30 year fix. And, and back then there was no 10 property limit. You know, they didn't have that. Yeah. You could have 30 houses, 40 houses like financed. And so um, you, you could do 10 Fannie. But then after that, there was tons of programs out there for non-owner refi, um, you know, 30-year fix. And so I just started accumulating all these homes. And like the other big exit strategy we had was I would buy them, find them, rehab them, refinance them. And then my wife was sticking all these families in them who spoke, who spoke Spanish. Uh -huh. And so we were buying the Northeast heavy, like St. John. Uh, north of St. John, uh -huh, that whole yeah. Independence yeah. Avenue area. Yeah. Like, I, I just wouldn't go south of Independence Avenue. Yeah. You know, Independence Avenue even got a little ghetto for me. Like, I would stay, no, anything north of St. John was an automatic buy for me. And then yeah. when it got between St. John and Independence, it was like uh, I had to go check it out the streets. Yeah. And so yeah. we started buying like everything down there and refinancing and just starting this. And before you know it, we had. Uh, Shit, like a oh, hundred something houses, all in the Northeast, and we had, we had no property management software. We were managing our own properties, and my wife and me were the property manager. We were the real estate agents. We were the contractors. We did everything. Like, and like, I had like three really good Hispanic crews that could do like four to five homes a piece. Mm -hmm. So I would, I, I remember one guy was Manny. I would just deal with Manny and Manny would have like seven crews going. So seven projects with this guy, seven projects with this guy, seven projects with this guy. And I was just, we were just. And these are 1099? Yeah, all 1099 subs, labor only. Did you have any W-2 employees at the time? No. Just you and Just and me and my wife. Yeah, well, and so we were, we were the only two employees. Everybody was 1099. Um, all the contractors, I would just pay Manny and Manny would pay his people, you know? And so I kind of set it up to where I was just dealing, I wasn't dealing with 20 subs, I was dealing with three guys. And those three guys had all the subs. And was, so- Was the management headache part of the reason that you decided to sell in, in, in two Yeah, that was for sure the biggest reason we sold was because, and then we didn't even sell, I'll tell you the story, but yeah, it was stressful. You know, and I had my wife out there in the middle of the streets in the Northeast, showing homes, and it was just, it was not only stressful, I look back, it was dangerous. And like, there was a lot of things going on with the gangs and the, you know, yeah. all the, the Northeast was kind of rough. And so it was, it was, it was uh, definitely one of the reasons we wanted to sell. My wife couldn't take it no more, you know? And like, we had what we called like, we called it grace books. You know, we just had like Excel spreadsheets and like, it was January, February, March, April, May, and who paid rent, who didn't pay rent, who do we got to evict? You know, it was like, we had no software, we had nothing. It was just all made up shit that we had to make to track how you, like what you're doing. And so we finally brought in, you know, we finally bought in some help. Um, we hired like a, a property manager. I hired a processor to help me with the loans. Uh -huh. um, and so we did have those two uh, people come in and help us, uh, you know, with everything. And then like, we just started looking for an exit. I was like, man, so I, I packaged up like 30 houses mm -hmm. and I started putting them out there to all these real estate investment groups. 
And so Mari, which is still around, I think Kim Tucker, she was the one that runs the yeah, Kansas City. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and so when I go, I was like, oh shit, there's a Mari everywhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like if you look online, they're, they're all over the place. Yeah. So I started sending, I packaged up like 30, 40 houses and I sent them out to all these real estate investment groups around the country and I got a hit. You know, and one of them was like, yeah, we're interested, we wanna buy. And I was like, they was like, you got any more? I was like, shit, I got a hundred of these. And I was like, well, send them all to us. I was like, perfect. So I sent them all to this uh, real estate investment group out of San Francisco. And they end up, I don't know, they had like 30, 40 buyers. And they ended up buying like 90 wow. of these homes from us. And wow. the last, they bought them in packages of 30. So they went 30, 60, and then they stopped and said, we're not going to buy the last 90 unless you manage the portfolio because we can't find Spanish speaking property managers mm -hmm. in Kansas City. And so boom, the property management company is born uh -huh. out of necessity to make the sale on the last 30 homes. And so what ended up happening is we started Las Casas property management, okay. which was uh, basically the management company. So we sold all the houses, but retained all the management yeah and yeah. and so we did that and, and that's um, something you didn't really want to do because you're trying to offload the burden of jacking up the property right but and in order to get those sold you did it yeah but, but it, that ended up being a good deal for you oh that was the best thing that happened because what it created for me was the thought and the idea of vertically integrated systems and being able to take one house and make a commission, make a construction commission. I was doing maintenance, I was doing make readies. Every month you'd have 13, 14 people move out. I'd have to get those homes ready, I made a margin. All the toilets, all the furnaces, every, you know, you're snaking drains for 100, you're billing out 150, you know, stuff like that. So yeah. like, it yeah. just created, and then when they wanna sell, they come back to you to sell, more commission. And so it was like, it was just crazy when, it, when I figured out that, that's when like life really changed for me. I was like, okay, we gotta create these companies and capture all this revenue that this one house, we can eat five times off this one house. Right. And so when we figured that out and it was that sale and it was the property management and it's like a car lot, right? The car lots, they don't make money selling the car. They make money on the servicing, the oil changes, the brakes, the, the carburetor, the engine, you know, and, the, and the, the 10 years that the person brings the car in for service, that's the high margin right there. It's, and so yeah. it was that same model, but using, you know, real estate. So we started, we, I left Century 21, my wife became, she started a, a real estate agent, she did it for two years, she became a broker, we started Grace Real Estate Company. It was me, uh, my wife, and you, you don't know this guy, but Bernie will know. Jimmy Webb was one of those oh, I know big, Jimmy, yeah. Jimmy Webb was, yeah. yeah. So Jimmy Webb was like our third agent. Um, As a matter of fact, <laughs> you know, we were talking about that Celsa property, yeah. and he's helping us on that one. Oh, he's yeah. helping you guys yeah. fix it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Jim, so, yeah so, so Jimmy was the biggest investor, I think, back in the day who I did, I would do 10 loans a month for this guy on end loans, you know, just, yeah, yeah. so Jimmy would call me like, hey, I got 10 more, hey, I got, like every month the guy had 10 more houses and he was just cranking them. I think he owned like 350 something houses at yeah. one time. Yeah. And so I had Jimmy and I had like all, like 10 other guys like him, you know, so, and that, those were all Bernie's clients. Yeah. And he yeah. was, he was financing all these guys. And so I was doing all these end loans and it's, so I made a lot of great connects. I met a lot of great investors. And it was just like, we just kind of started going crazy. And like once I had the exit strategy for the loans and we could pay off, they could get into more. And so it just was like, they would call me every month. With, and not one guy would call me with 10, another guy would call me at eight, another guy would call me with six. Another, so the, the pipeline was just loaded. with. This them. is after the 08 crash? No, this is before the 08 crash. Okay. This is before the 08 crash. So like, we're, we're selling, I sold, so that whole time I was doing the loans, Jimmy and all in buying and, and, and then like, you know, once, once 08 happened, I think, uh, I think I sold the last 30 homes in January of 07. And I think Lehman Brothers starts choking up in August, September. That was the big one that dropped first. And then the, things really went bad. And like my whole loan business went to shit. Like 
nobody wanted to take the non-owner paper after that. Like there was, and like Jimmy and all of them guys, all these investors, they were all going stated. None of them was showing income. Right. And so Bernie told no me, doc loans, no stated doc, income. stated income, 90%, like cash, out, frenzy. cash out refine, 90%, 95%, non-owner, yeah. using the appraised value, no seasoning on the title. Like I had I had 30 banks I could take this paper to and I was just knocking them out. And then so, so when the recession hit, one thing Bernie always told me, he didn't agree with the stated stuff. He said, Pat, pay your taxes, go full dock. You got to pay to play. So I, I, we did. And that changed us. That changed because in the recession, the banks, small local banks, Pony Express Bank and the Central Bank, all these small local banks around Kansas City, they all had money, but you, they didn't want to loan it unless you could go full dock. So I was like the perfect candidate. I had experience now. I had hundreds of homes, I had tons of income, I had tons of equity, and I had great tax returns. So through the recession, I continued to buy, and I just had the knowledge, oh shit, I just sold 100 homes to this, basically this hedge fund. Um, so I said, you know what, let me do that again. Let me start, let me make a pitch, and let's go look for some hedge funds. So I did a presentation to a, a hedge fund out of Newport Beach, California, I went in there, and man, I walk in there with an Aloha shirt on and jeans, and uh, these guys are all wearing suits. And I was like, holy shit. And I got all so nervous, I was sweating, and I was like, okay, you got this, dude, because you know what you're talking about. You live this. Like, and I went in there, and I was like, hey, I'm not a professional speaker, but I am a professional real estate investor. And I am the guy on the street that makes this whole portfolio happen, and here's how I do it, and what I do. And they, it was so raw. They loved it. They was like, hey, we'll start you off with two million bucks. Let's go. And I was like, done. So I go back to Kansas City where the world's falling apart. Everybody's losing their house and the smart money's sitting here buying it. You know what I mean? So like yeah. all the hedge funds were sitting here just picking all this stuff up. And they loved Raytown. They loved Independence. They loved Grandview. They loved those areas. And I hated those areas. I loved North Kansas City. So I had moved up north at this time after I made the sale. Uh -huh. I moved up north. I had a fat house in Staley Farms on a private golf course, and I was like, I'm gonna bring all these investments, I'm gonna bring all this cash and all this money up north. And that's what I did. I, I saw anything that came up up north, I would keep for myself, and then I was sitting here popping off 10 homes, 15 homes a month for this hedge fund through the recession, which is kind of what got me through the recession. And all my friends, and all my friends who were investors, these big real estate investors, lost everything because mm -hmm. they couldn't finance. If you can't finance, they basically lost their job. They couldn't get any more loans. They couldn't get any more paper. And like a lot of the houses went into foreclosure. It was just a tough, but all those homes that went into foreclosure, I knew about all of them. I financed them all. So all the good ones I would buy and just, you know, it was just like, a, it was just like the craziest part. And, you know, I got to transform this whole portfolio to North Kansas City. So back in the day, I was buying homes in Nashua and up by Staley Farms for 65 grand, three bed, two bath, two car garage homes for $65,000, 70. Me and my wife would argue. She went to a Kate's auction and paid 75 grand. She went there to buy the lawnmower, ended up buying the house for 75 grand. Mm -hmm. And me and her got into an argument because I told her she overpaid by 10 grand. And today, we still own the house today, and the sucker's worth $275,000. And we were sitting here tripping over 10 grand. You know, and, so, and back in the day, the homes were renting for 800, 850, 900. Now I'm catching 1,900. You know, and I got a portfolio of these homes. So yeah. you know, people don't stop it. When you, when I, uh, one thing I always tell my investors is like, you underwrite for today, but you never think about what's going to happen 10 years from now. You know, and like the, the power. So, like, yeah. you think about. All the homes we're buying today for 200 grand. Now I'm paying 180, 200,000 for foreclosures in Staley, mm -hmm. in that neighborhood where I was paying 60. And so it'll continue to go up. I, yeah. We're going to sit here and look back on this podcast and be like, man, remember the days we was buying them homes for 200 grand? You know, and it'd probably be worth oh, 600 grand. Yeah. 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 And so uh, I, I really think Kansas City is on the come up. I think uh, one of the best cities to invest in. And I think other like big companies are coming here. There's so much development happening. And so like for me, 
I'm taking a lot of positions in like Lee Summit, Blue Springs, out east over there, and then up north. Uh -huh. And that's kind of where I'm focused on my investing right now. And I'm just sticking with that model, like the three bed, two bath, two car garage, split level, 1,500 square foot. Yeah. How many shitty neighborhoods you know in Kansas City where all your neighbors got two car garage? Yep. Real yeah, simple. So that's an, that, yeah. that, and that's an easy, that's an <laughs> yeah. easy thing to look for, and it, it's just so true. It is, and it's like I told my investors that you're from out of town, stick with the two car garage neighborhood. Yeah, you will. I don't know any shitty neighborhoods in Kansas City where all the whole, the the entire neighborhood got two car garage. Yeah, so that's, that's a real simple underwrite yep. to just keep safe with your money. And then I, you know, now I, I dive into the one car garage areas, you know, for a little bit cheaper product for some of my investors. Uh -huh. But yeah, so that's kind of where everything started was what, what would what would your advice be to someone who's they're, they're they're getting started like you were back in 2000 but they're doing it right now and there isn't all of this easy financing yeah the world has changed you can't go in and do the stated income and right. no doc loans and it's not it's not such a feeding frenzy what would your advice be to your younger self if you were starting off now so i think i would i think the biggest thing we did was we always i, I never filed my tax return in april I always filed my tax return in October. And what that did was that gave me hindsight on what my year is looking like. So even this year, like this year, uh, I sold almost 50 homes this year out of my portfolio. I was up to 250 something houses. Now I think at the other day I looked, I'm like 195 or something. Mm -hmm. So I sold a whole bunch of homes, which means I have less debt, which means I can show less income. And so me knowing that, in, in October, I can file my tax return accordingly. So I always file my taxes to where I can be at a 25, 28% debt to income. And so uh, having a good loan officer or knowing how to do loans yourself and just filing your taxes right, you know, with, with real estate, there's so many write-offs and there's so many things with 1031s and cost segs and all this stuff you can do uh, to minimize taxes. Um, but uh, making sure you're financeable is the biggest thing I think uh, what and, and it's the biggest hindrance for a lot of my investors you know like they want to get in but they, they just bought a house and they're at 45 percent DTI there's no room for them to buy investments to get financing um, they're, they're tapped out and so the only way you can affect your DTI is either make more money or have less debt and so you know kind of Gauging that and making sure that you're you're there and then you know using lines of credit using the assets you have like a lot of people have Equity in their house right now, mm -hmm. you know, and they're sitting on a hundred grand in their property and it's just sitting there They're not using it. Mm -hmm. And so Tapping in and going going to your small local banks like Mazuma and Community America and you know uh, those, those people that are holding your loans and asking them for a line of credit to access the equity in your house and then using that equity to purchase short-term investments flips mm -hmm. you know I mean you got to get in you got to flip like three homes and then keep one you know flip three and keep one and do you use the DSCR loan now yeah they, they and they do have I, I don't use it per se for me right now but a lot of my investors are my newer investors are using the DSCR uh, type paper um, right now so they do have that but you know they're limited to 70 75 percent LTV um, their rates are high mm -hmm. um, and so for me right now I've got so many assets like I've got lines I'm a big line of credit guy I use this line of credit strategy that I've teach that I teach all my investors and that I've talked about but like I never finance on 30-year amortized mortgage you ever stop to think how you got this $75,000 Tahoe and you can pay it off in five years, but you can't pay seventy-five thousand off on your mortgage in five years. Mm -hmm. It's because they're, they're too different. They're, they're, it's the debt structure. Mm -hmm. So when you have compound amortized loans, you're not paying off shit. When you have simple interest line of credit, you're, you'll pay it off fast. And so I've kind of transformed all my debt to simple interest line of credit, um, and, and and it's easy. Like I can take twenty properties to a bank. They give me a $4 million valuation. Mm -hmm. They'll sit here and give me $3.2 million, 3 million bucks on a line of credit. And then I just use that money 
to go buy my house's cash, remodel them cash, and then I sell them. I pay my line back, and I can I can I can actually put all my rents into that line of credit, all my cash flow. I put into the line of credit is like a checking account for me. So all my rents go in there. All my cash when I sell a house, everything goes into the lines, and I end up paying these lines off in seven, Smart. eight years Smart. instead of using. Uh, you know, these compound amortized 30 year structures. Like I'm, I don't, really, I haven't used that um, in a long time. So a little bit advanced strategy, but that strategy really changed my life. And one of the secrets that kind of propelled me from being this average investor to this next level investor was like, okay. And then once you got, now I've got all these properties online. I got my commercial buildings. I've got, they're all paid off. I'm sitting there with access to, I've got four or five lines where I've got access to at least five million bucks mm -hmm. and the money's just sitting there and I can go to any one of those lines, grab the money, buy property, put down payments, do the builds in Florida that I'm doing on the ocean. All the stuff that I'm doing is coming all from line of credit and assets that I've accumulated over you know, the last 20 years. And so that's been a really a big game changer for me. But 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 it's back to finance. And a person could say, oh, well, I don't have a $5 million line of credit, so no. I can't. But what you said to begin with, you've got $100,000 debt equity sitting right. in your house. Get a line of credit on that. That's enough to do one deal. Then you can borrow against the equity that you have in the next deal, and you snowball. Right. Yeah. And really, with a hundred grand, if you've got a two hundred thousand dollar house, you got to put down forty five, fifty thousand. You might with a hundred grand, you might be able to get into two small deals. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you go look at, and if you don't even get, if you just do one car garage type stuff in Independence, you can pick, you can get into two deals easy. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you just do those two deals, six months to eight months, sell them, and then get into another two deals. You know, in your first year, you should be able to knock out at least four real estate transactions. You know where you can make twenty to thirty grand spread on the like I won't even touch a house if I can't make at least thirty thousand dollars on it. You and know? are you helping entrepreneurs do that with your network, or are you helping investors buy properties turnkey, or both? Both. So like I have like local investors and a lot of my agents. You know now now we got United Real Estate. My wife runs this awesome broke. So we took Grace Real Estate with like five agents and we started United Real Estate. And now my wife got over 350 agents in Kansas City. Wow. They're closing 150 deals a month. It's just like a remat, like a just purchase business, you know? And so um, a lot of my agents, what I'm coaching them and showing them is like, boy, you guys are running into these good deals. Keep them, buy them, I'll finance them. I'm financing my agents and like uh -huh. uh, showing them how to buy rehab. And now my agents are making an extra 100,000 a year just by on real estate investments on top of what they're making uh, in their, you know, in their um, personal, whatever, real estate business. And so this is, uh, we, I, I do help a lot of people, but a, a lot of the stuff I do is more turnkey. You know, so like I'll buy it, rehab it, rent it, and then I put it out there for my investors to buy. If they don't buy it, I'll just portfolio it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I've got this great model where, and I don't, I'm not buying shit in the inner city. I'm not doing uh, really any Section 8, any low ends. I'm not doing that kind of stuff. I mean, everything I'm doing is $250,000, $350,000 neighborhoods. Uh, not a lot of cash flow, uh, but great areas and easy rents and lower evictions and just, you know, um, for me, like evictions and vacancy is like kryptonite. Mm -hmm. And so I gotta, I wanna be in areas, and when you're managing other people's money, it's even more, you can't sleep at night when all your customers have vacant, you know, and they're pissed off and mad. And so it's like, I had to get out of that area of the inner city and the lower end projects. And like, so we, when we came up north, it just kind of changed everything. So that's what we're offering people right now is, a lot of turnkey, and then if people come to me, they want mentorship or they want some coaching. Uh, my biggest problem right now is inventory, mm -hmm. right? So I don't have, like back in the day, I had 15, 20, 25 projects at one time. If you wanted one, I could give it to you. It wouldn't hurt me. Mm -hmm. Now I find five good projects. I'm not giving any of them up. Yep. You know, I'm keeping those. Yep. And so if you have projects that you find or you have property that you find and you just need help with 
the process, the people, mm -hmm. who to go to, yeah. where to go, how to meet you, how to get the loan done, how to get the draws done. How, is this a good bid for a roof and HVAC? Who's your guy? What, you know, like figuring all that out, the scope of work, uh, the end loans, the sale process, like that we can mentor and coach and help with. So we do offer that. And that's more for our investors who live here. Mm -hmm. And and then the out of town guys, you know, I've got doctors and lawyers. These guys don't want to deal with fucking rehab projects. They want they want rent, cash flow, and and so you know it's been slow. It's probably my slowest year. Do you see the inventory crunch breaking anytime soon? And and how's it gonna break? No, I mean, I think I think it's gonna get worse uh, before it gets better. And I'll I'll tell you this on this podcast right now. Here's what I think is going to happen. So we're in an election year, and no matter what happens or who gets elected, the other half of the country who didn't believe in that guy or that girl right. is going to think the world's coming to yeah, an end. I agree and you. so yeah. the stock market's going to crash, mm -hmm. and things are going to happen. Yeah. And so just be ready. But I'm, I might be, I don't know if I should even say this, but I'm, if Trump wins what I feel... I give them 18 months and you're going to have record breaking stock market. You're, the market's going to be back. Rates are going to be low. You know, he's like, he's a business president. He's going to make moves. That's the same thing that happened last time. Right. And, and so now if the other side wins, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I, that I'm just kind of hoping, and I, and I'm not saying that hey, I'm in love with Trump. I'm just saying that I, I do love his policy and I do love the stuff that like what he does for business to me. Yeah, owning love business. Love him or hate him. Yeah, a few politicians go out and tell you all these things they're going to do, and then knock them dead. Right. And go do them all. Yeah. I mean, you might not agree with every policy that that he has, but man, he does a lot yeah. of what he says he's going to do. And he's, I think he's a good business president. You know, if you own companies, if you own businesses, I think that's. You know, I think he's going to be the one that's going to make the you know stuff happen for us. So, uh, you know, I'm, I, for me, I, I'm not really. I just continue buying. You know, I'm buying stuff, but I mean, until right right now, who's going to leave their three and a half percent mortgage for six and a half seven percent money right now? Yeah. So all the horses are clogged up. Everybody's sitting on them homes right now. Nobody's nobody's moving unless you have to. What and happens when, the, the, let's say, after election, because like you said, half the country is going to be uh, throwing a temper tantrum regardless of who wins. Stock market goes in the toilet. What happens after that? Is this a buying opportunity for houses? Does yeah. inventory come in the market? Does inventory, inventory stay put? What do you think plays out real estate? Well, I think, I, think, I think inventory will come on the market. And this is why, as an investor, I just never stop buying. You know, it's like... It's like they tell you in stocks too. You'll never time the high, you'll never time the low, but if you just dollar cost average in, mm -hmm. you'll, you'll buy stuff at the high and you'll buy stuff at the low and it'll all average out. And the same thing with real estate. So for me, I just keep buying and I'm seeing in my, in my business and like the company United, I mean, I'm seeing homes sit on the market longer. I mean, we're in the busiest time of the year right now and my homes ain't moving. Yeah. You know, I've yeah. got homes we're sitting. The same thing. Yeah, so it's like, we're, in, we're right in the middle of it, and you're going to look back and be like, oh, shit, man, it was, it's was it been messed up since July, yeah. you know, and ever since June. Yeah. And so um, I think my last good month was in March, mm -hmm. you know, and then April was all right. May sucked. June sucked. Mm -hmm. July is not looking so good. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, so, like, I feel like we're right in the middle of it right now where the homes aren't moving. People are sitting and, and just kind of waiting and so, and this is supposed to be our busy time. Can you imagine what's going to happen in September, October, November, December? Like the slower part of the year is going to be even worse. So, but that will, I think, create uh, a good buying opportunity. So now is the time to just save cash, uh, get ready. Um, you know, as a good deals come through, and and just don't buy marginal deals. You know, like. I used to do that a lot because I had to provide so much inventory for people. I'd buy right. stuff for 10%, 12%. You know, now I'm not touching that stuff. Like, yeah. if I can't make a good margin on it, I don't want it. And so I'm just, like, being more selective on the areas, the margins. And But I still buy. Like, I'm buying. I'm just not buying as much because mm -hmm. uh, there's not anything out there. Like, I get, I get 10 deals a day come through my desk. Uh -huh. And... 
all 10 of them are trash. You know what I mean? They're just trash. They're in trashy areas. The, the numbers aren't good. Um, so it's like right now, I think I'm buying maybe four homes a month, five homes a month right now, where I was buying 15 to 20, uh -huh. you know? And so now it's like, it's, which is good. You know, it allows you to slow down, perfect your systems, your people, your process, and just kind of, you know, so that's kind of what we're doing now is just, uh, we, we've slowed down a lot and, and not, and, and by choice, you know what I mean? So, you talked about the Excel sheets starting out. Everything yeah. was on a simple Excel sheet. Yeah, yeah. You're off the Excel sheets now. Yeah. What, what are your systems? So for, for property management, I'm using Appfolio. Okay. Um, that software has been a game changer for us. Um, is that an expensive software? No, nah, I mean, it, it, and it's, it's hard for the new guy because I think you got to have a minimum of maybe 30 properties or 50 properties before because they charge per property. Okay. And so uh, and the more property you have, the cheaper it is. But it is a all-inclusive, like I can, you know, I run all my marketing for my properties, all my leasing, pulling credit, criminal, all the checks go through that property, uh, I mean, through that um, software. Mm -hmm. Uh, all of you know, just managing all, all my deposits, all the direct deposits for the for either the customers or for myself. Um, you know, just everything. It's a, it's an all inclusive, just really good software that has everything you're going to need. What are um, some other softwares that you've that you found that are you can't live without? So the other um, on the on the construction company, believe it or not, I'm still using um, uh, Google. And, and spreadsheets there. We tried Builder Trend and some other like construction software, but it just we just kind of went back to, you know, our pipeline is all on, on spreadsheets. Mm -hmm. And then, we, I mean, it's real, I don't know if you call it ghetto or what, but it's like, we still use Manila files. Uh -huh. And like we write like, you know, the change orders on there. And like, I turn that into my construction lady and she orders everything and then it's like, you know, we can just, every time I'm out there, I can just check off what's done. And it just seems to be the easiest system uh, for me. Um, and so we still use, we're still using um, Google on that. And just more marketing and, you know, like uh, Facebook and like all the social medias and the socials and like the Opus I was telling you is a good one. Um, on the real estate side, United has a proprietary software that they've developed called Bullseye, which is a CRM that we use or that I use that has all my clients in there. It has automated trip campaigns. It has postcard for just everything you need in one mm -hmm. software for the client relation um, software. But but between um, between Bullseye and uh, Appfolio for my for my portfolio, um, that's pretty much the two main um, softwares that I'm in. And then now I use other software like for like I've got. We were talking about this earlier, like all the letters that I send out to buy, you know, people who want to sell their homes and like my KC cash closings, which is like my, my, uh, you know, like home investors or we buy ugly houses, you know, that kind of company where I buy your house cash, blah, blah. Um, you know, I'm using Google and Facebook and the letters. And, and so um, I use a software called Spark, um, which handles, you know, I can... All the customers are in there. Uh, I can make the phone calls, the text messages, the emails, so like we can write the notes. So you have everything in there for you know the, the new buys on the um, and, and trying to find more inventory and, and more product. And that's uh, called Spark. Yeah, I use a, uh, it's called Spark or Magnify. Mm -hmm. um, and then I use a company called REI Complete for all my mailers. And then REI Complete has a software within their system that's really awesome. That has the, uh, the the SMS, the email, yep. Um, yep. the phone calls, the Google numbers, and they you know they actually like uh, have a division that handles all the calls. So when people respond to the letters, it's their people who answer. Mm -hmm. When they come live or hot or they yeah we want to sell, yeah we want a meeting, they let me know, and then I can go in there, I can read all the notes, I can hear all the recordings, I can hear the voicemails, I can hear the phone calls, and then I can call and be like okay let's set up a time and this and that. And so. I use that That's software great. for that company. So just uh, yeah, but having an organized system for every company, and then you know having uh, employees and being able to delegate has been uh, one thing I, I had to learn. But what's your management structure look like? So right now it's like me, 
and my wife, we kind of own everything. And then like on the construction company, I have one lady who kind of like the office manager. And then I have uh, one inspector who's out in the streets inspecting all the projects. And then I have a bunch of 1099 contractors who are uh, doing all the work. And then on the property management side, I have one property manager, I have one leasing agent, and I have one collection agent. And that's really it. And then my wife has uh, two brokers, maybe three brokers with her, helping her with the, and then we have uh, two secretaries um, on, the, on the real estate side. So really, I think we have like nine, maybe nine W-2 people right now in okay. the company. Um, that work that help us and then what we've done is we've hired all of our managers uh, virtual assistants from the Philippines so we use a lot of VAs how does that um, go I've never done that but I hear people doing it, it oh it, best thing ever I mean like man I've got a lady named Annie who really runs my entire collection division on all 200 of my houses this lady doesn't even live here and you know she's I mean? running the, the software at Folio, she's in at Folio. Did she know that software to begin with? No. You, you taught I had her. a trainer, yeah. Wow. And, but there's a company called 4REI, okay? And they're a, F a Philippine based company, and everybody that they give you has real estate experience. Yeah. And so if you need a cold caller, if you need a property manager, you just tell them kind of what you need and they'll get you three, four people and you can interview them over the phone, you can do Zoom, you can see them, you can hear them, you can give them a sample script, you can hear if they have it. If you need a phone caller, you don't want somebody with a heavy accent. And so you can tell them, I need somebody who has experience in doing phone calls, I can't, I, I can't have the heavy accent, this and that. They'll find them for you and you just, you just interview them and hire who you want. But I think I pay them like 11 bucks, 12 bucks an hour. Wow. And they're so loyal. They're, they're so good. I, I bonus them through Venmo, you know, and, I, and, and so, you know, you give a, a lady in the Philippines a, a $300 bonus. She, that, I mean, there's so much money where she's from. It's unbelievable. So they're happy. And like, she's so good. And like all the VAs, and sometimes you gotta let some go. Like, hey, you know, after two weeks, we kind of know who's mm -hmm. gonna work or not, right. you know. And so you let them go, you get another one. You tell the company you need another one, and like, hey, this guy ain't gonna work. We need another person. And so, but all the assistants that I have for my managers, so like Barb handles my property management and my leasing, and Melanie is our VA. Melanie's doing all the screenings. She's doing all the tenant turner boxes. She's doing all of the, you know, I got boxes that they can take a picture of your ID, self-showing boxes. She handles all that, all the leads that come in, she calls, converts to showings, and then, the show, and then they do self-showings. And then from the self-showing, you're trying to get applications. And then from the app, you gotta run the apps, you gotta pull the credit, you gotta get the criminal checks, you gotta get the W-2s, so all that stuff is done by her. And then they just bring me full files, I just make decisions real quick. like. Okay, yeah, yes, no, yes, no, wow. and move on. And so um, that's kind of how we run. And then the whole collection part of my business on all the rents is a, is a virtual assistant um, that's been with me for maybe three years now. She's been with us. She's awesome. And so I, I, would, I would definitely look into, and then how I trained them is I just, I just Google me. I just kept them on the computer. I would, I would assign them a task and say, here, and I'm on my computer working for three, four hours in my office anyway, and they're just on the Google Meet, and they're doing their work, and if they have any questions, they can chime in. And just I like you're sitting right next to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, so just Google Meet, you just Google Meet, and you do that for 30 days, and wow. you know, and, and within, within a week, I could tell, like, if she's not catching what I'm laying down, then I, I need to move on. Like, I have very short patience, and I, I'm not gonna sit here and invest a lot of time into somebody who is not gonna work. And so I make those decisions quick, but like once I find the people who are like, okay, they, they can catch on to a, a, a system and a process and a, and a pattern, you know, that's kind of what I, I like. And so when they, when they figure out patterns and they figure out, okay, let's continue to do this, then makes it easy. Yeah. And so, man, that's solid gold. I mean, there's so many things that you're, that you're putting out there. That, that's how you build a business like you have. All of these tricks, but there's so many of them. Yeah. It's, and, and you know, it's like, I, I don't know, I, I don't know, uh, I don't even know how this stuff happens, 
I, to be honest, I've been just been blessed with a capital B, but you know, I've, I figured things out. I try new things all the time. I do listen to a lot of people around me. And like the VAs was something I got from, uh, you know, I'm in, this, I'm in this really big mastermind group with uh, Kent Clothier and it's called Boardroom and it's like, you know, all the top real estate investors in the country. We meet up about four times um, a year and it's, uh, you know, I've learned so much mm -hmm. uh, through, you know, so just being around people and putting yourself in positions where you're not the biggest fish in the room, yep. you know, being able to learn and being able to listen to what works for other, and that's what I love about going to those places is they cut down time. You know, it's like, hey, here's who you call, and here's how you get it done. Right. Don't it like, might take you a might year to, yeah, to stumble to all through the out. Yeah, it's like no, call this insurance agent. He can package up all 200 homes and get it done. He's already done it for this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy. Yeah. Easy, one call. Yeah, you know, and it's just done. Yeah, and so, yeah, this has been that's been a. a, a gold godsend for me is just tapping into a group like that where you have to invest you have to pay there's a cost to that you people know? have been a big part of your story yeah I, with J jimmy webb and some of those other guys from bernie and then bernie himself and then you have marta has 300 agents working there and then you get, you get the vertical integration through all of these different processes that happen yeah were you intentional about networking from from the beginning? Is yeah, I think that's always out? yeah, that's always been like my strength has been going out there and like you know, I love the social aspect. I mean, I loved I'd love to go out to lunch, have a drink, relax, talk, you know, and meet new people and like be at seminars and be at you know talks and you know just like I love that stuff and and then just meeting you know new people and now that. It, it, it's easier now um, that you have so much, you know, like when you have, when you have almost 300 agents, everybody wants to be your friend. You right. know, I mean, like title companies want to hook up, mortgage companies want to connect. They'll pay you all kind of money to sit in your office and give you stock or, or shares of a company so that you can, you know, you bring them all your title business. So, you know, it's like, so there's so much. And how much of that do you participate in? All of it. All of it. I mean, I've got, we've got. You know, we, I do a lot of business with Meridian Title. Mm -hmm. um, we do a lot of stuff with them. They're sitting in, in all of our offices. Uh, we participate with, with them. We started a new company. We've got some shares, um, you know, and so, um, you know, and, and like mortgage as well. Um, so now, now like, like on one real estate deal, like I can make money off, uh, you know, the, the sale transact, the buy transaction. I can make money off the finance. I can make money off the construction. I can make money off the title. Mm -hmm. I can make money off the insurance. I can make money off the property management. And then after they get tired of holding the asset for 10 years, they call me back and like, hey, let's sell. And then on the sale process, I make money on the sale. I make money on the title. I make money, you know what I mean? It's That's just sweet, like, and so one, like, I think real estate might be one of the greatest vehicles for this vertically integrated model. And I've done a lot of like talks and a lot of speeches on this because I feel like that's been a, a key to our success is figuring out how to capture multiple streams of income from one asset, mm -hmm. you know, and just uh, or one property. And so uh, we've done really well at that. And um, that's been key for, for us. And then, like you said, like, after doing this for almost 25 years now, you know, and my wife is strong. Like, I'm the guy that's got these ideas and I'll go meet the people and like, we're starting this new company. And then I need somebody there to set up the structure, the, the protocols, <laughs> the, the hiring, the firing. Um, that's now my wife. wife. Oh yeah, she's a, she's a beast at that. Like, she's so good at setting up yeah. all the systems, the processes, the everything that has to happen, like the back end system. And then my job is just to make sure the company has product, people, and stuff to sell and stuff to buy. And like, so, you know, filling the company with business is my job, but, you know, creating the entire uh, structure, the protocol, making sure you hire the right people. Um, you know, that's my wife is really good at that. And yeah, so yeah. we kind of got this, uh, um, you know, like peanut butter jelly. Great, <laughs> you know, great, like, great partnership. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's been that's good. That's great.
Yeah. Well, you hit on so many awesome points. I, there's so much that a person could take from this. Uh, anyone watching ought to be taking notes and rewind and a lot of good information here. Before we finish up, can you tell a person in their 20s or 30s who's watching this some action items, some concrete steps, what should they be doing to build their business? Um, so let me think about that because my mind automatically goes to a real estate business and I'm, you're, you might have more people on here not even uh, doing real estate. Well, but, a young, young version of you. So you're young, back in your 20s or 30s and you're starting in today's world. What do you tell yourself back then? So when we were young, it was no fear, no excuses, and get the shit done. You know, and like, there was no failure. And so I never accepted no as an answer from anyone. If you told me I couldn't do it, I would go do it. And um, that's kind of uh, the mindset, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, having a, a no failure mindset is key. And um, like setting yourself up, like knowing what, what, what I wish I did different back in the day is like n knowing my strengths and my weaknesses and then hiring out my weaknesses. You know, I feel like I played a long time in my weaknesses that I wasn't uh, particularly good at because I was honestly afraid to delegate mm -hmm. and afraid to hire people or partner or bring in people, you know, and so once we did it out of necessity, like once we had so much stuff, you have to hire, you need help. But I wish I would have done that um, a little bit earlier um, in, in life and like just, you know, just always kind of thinking to operate from your strengths um, makes it, it makes, it makes it so much easier. And then, um, you know, one big thing uh, is credit, you know, like, I would tell, I tell all my kids and I tell all their friends and I'm a, I mean, you better keep your credit straight. Like your credit is basically a reflection of your character. And if you're getting into deals with people and companies and credit cards and banks and cars and you can't make the payments and you can't, you, you, you can't live like that. You know, you can't overextend yourself and making sure that your credit is strong is the difference between you driving a Corolla and you driving an Escalade. Like people pay the same amount to drive the, that car and the guy with good credit is always gonna be paying less than the person with bad credit. And so, um, and I feel like the other thing for us that we had to learn when I was 20 is like and, and for most of us here, I mean, we're here in Kansas City, but choosing, you know, a place to live is important. Like, that's why we chose Kansas City. The cost of living was so cheap. The opportunities were so big. And you think about L.A., where my wife's from, we're Hawaii, and we both have degrees and we're living there. We're renters. We're not buying home. We're not, we don't have life insurance. We don't have 401ks. We don't have all the stuff that we had here because we chose to live here. Now, did we want to live in Kansas City? I can tell you the honest uh, truth is no. That's not where we wanted to live. And then our, it was like in the grand scheme of life, if we got to give up 20 years and make sure our last 30 years are comfortable, we're going to do that. That's the choice that we made. So we chose to stay in Kansas City. And now we're in that second 30. We don't need to work. We got tons of rentals. We got tons of properties. We can retire. We don't need to do all these deals. I don't need to sell 100 homes a year. I can just sell 20. I'd be comfortable. Right. And so, so we're, you know, and I'm thinking back when I was 20 on the things that slowed me down. It's that kind of stuff, you know, like protecting, protecting your credit, um, choosing a good mate, you know, somebody, you know, you don't so want to be getting divorced. You don't want to be going through that kind of trauma, like choosing somebody you can trust, somebody who has the same vision and the same alignment as you do when it comes to business and who will have your back and, and set stuff up and stay up every night with you. I mean, me and my wife still stay up every night. We're on our laptop watching American Idol jamming till 10 o'clock, you know, and like working, you know, and getting stuff done right next to each other. And my kids see it and like it's every night, 
You know, it's like we're still sitting there. We, we work all day. We run around all day. And then at night, we're sitting here on the laptops just putting things to bed, putting things to rest, getting things sign this, do this, do, you know, just like. So choosing the right mate, I think, is super important um, in life and making sure that you're with somebody who has the same goals and the same, um, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but the same energy um, as you do and the same passion, I yeah. guess, would be yeah. the word that I'm looking for. Um, it, whereas you're not gonna have all these arguments. Yeah, yeah. Well, guys, take note. Pat is a, he's an excellent example of living the American dream, coming from nothing and building uh, an empire and doing it through lessons learned and humility and working on with other people. And it's, yeah. it's just an inspiration, your whole story. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming we've in. We've been, we've been blessed. You can find me on patgrace.com as my website. Um, all the socials on Pat Grace or on Pat Grace 25 on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, also, um, Kansas City Real Estate Investment Group is my real estate group on Facebook. It's the largest real estate group in Kansas City. I've got over 50,000 followers on that group. So wow. um, that's a good group to tie into. Um, there's so much property on there. There's so I, everybody, anybody who has anything to sell in Kansas City, I promise you, is putting it on that group and every big player in Kansas City who does property um, or sells volume is on that group and anybody who buys volume is on that group so a lot of my friends a lot of my partners a lot of people I've been doing business with for 25 years work with everybody's in that group and so you need plumbers you need electricians what just put it out there I need a plumber I need this guy I need a mud jacker and you'll have 30 responses uh, so it's a great group for new investors, and um, that, that would be a Kansas City Real Estate Investment Group on Facebook. Sounds good. Pat, thank you so much. Awesome, it's been man. a pleasure, man. Yep. Thank you, guys. All right. Way to go. Man, that was great. Yeah, I knew once we got to flowing, it would just go. Oh, man. It was, <laughs> yeah, it was great. That's, yeah. that's going to be our best episode. Your story, I mean, it, it's... It's an awesome story. It, I mean, you've you guys have just accomplished so much. Yeah, we've been we've been lucky. But that I mean, like the stuff I said is true. Like, I watch I watch a lot of my investors fall apart with the marriages. Yeah. And divorce. Yeah. Some yeah. fucking killer. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and they just got to reset, and you got half your shit gone, and you've got no drive. They just. Yeah, it's just tough. So yeah, like, I've been married for 11, 11 years now. Same, same woman. Uh, we got married when we were, I don't know, 20 something, 23 yeah. years old. Yeah, yeah. Too. I got, me and my wife just did 24 years last Sunday. And we was in Vegas at pool parties. Uh huh. Yeah. And still kicking it, still drinking, still relaxing, yeah. have, hey, hanging out there. We're at, Tao in uh -huh. Vegas with 20 year olds, 25 year olds, and little John was out there rapping. In the oh, really? <laughs> wow, wow, that'd be fun. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, we just, we went to, it was like, we got 24 years. That's, we just woke up uh, Thursday, it was like, shit. You want to go to Vegas this weekend? Yeah, yeah like, that's that's great. Those are the best trips when you just yeah, spare a moment yeah. Friday. Oh, it's like bad. we can't be gone for long because we're going to Florida. We're leaving to Florida tomorrow for ten days to go check on all the beach houses and the projects yeah. we're doing. Yeah, and she's like, and our daughters are back from college now, and so uh, we didn't want to be gone too long. And uh, my daughter's got to leave in in August for to go back to school. Mm -hmm. So we were like, yeah, let's just go to Vegas for the weekend and relax. I'm going to Florida. My son lives in Florida. He's card? Miami. Okay. So he played football out there for a Division II school in Miami, and he ended up staying out there. So he got his Miami, he's got his real estate license in Florida. He's working for a wholesale company out there. They're doing a lot of like wholesale deals. So he's getting trained and learning how to make calls and, you know, cold calling and yeah. calling people from the letters and the, you know, all this, the, the Facebook and the Google ads and the yep. people that are responding to software. So he's doing that. How old is he? He's 23. 23. 
Mm -hmm. Yep. And so, you know, it's funny because I think he doesn't want to come back to Kansas City and be in my shadow. You know, he's like, he's yeah. like, I want to do what you guys do. Like, I know that's the right thing to do, and I know, but I want to do it in Florida. Yeah, that makes we don't sense. have a it's network. Hard to live in, have... in Dev's shadow. Yeah, yeah, and so, you know, so. We're out there, and I, I told him, I'm like, dude, we'll be buying stuff. I'm not buying stuff in Miami, but that Melbourne Beach area, oh, man, I love that area. I feel like I feel like Melbourne Beach is how I felt about Kansas City when I first ran into it. I'm like, uh -huh. ain't nothing going on here. A bunch of old people, yeah. sleepy, yeah. old town, with no commercial, no, no commercial industry, nothing to do. Yeah. The real estate's cheap. The oceanfront property is cheap. You're yeah. on the Atlantic Ocean. The sand is white. The water's blue. You can surf. My wife's sitting out there, tan and naked. You got there's, <laughs> there's just there's nobody there. It's like the best. I'm like I can't believe I ran into this town. So I was like, you know what? Let me buy two oceanfront lots and build some stuff. Is that where all of your properties are that you're working on? Yeah, yeah. It's all in that little area right there. Um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna probably be taking more positions. Uh, down there, I just I might have got in over my head a little bit on these two big ones. You know, they're like three, four million dollars a piece, and so you know it's hard to get insurance on yeah. stuff. Now. Yeah. And like down there, you know, I don't know. Mentioned. I don't know how the Airbnb market's going to be. Well, one of them will be my second home, so I'm not worried about that. The other one's a duplex, a complete investment property, but it's high end luxury. Elevate yep. elevators yeah. on each side. I've seen the pictures of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pools, hot tubs on the ocean with elevators. And oh, it's man. Like, yeah, I don't know if everything will cash flow. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Have but, you ever had a rental like that? No. A top flight luxury? No, deal. no. All my, no, no. All my stuff is right here in Kansas. This is the first time I even venture outside of Kansas City. You know, like I've never, I've never went outside of Kansas City. So this is all new stuff for us. But, I know, I, I know the systems, I know the process, I got the recipe, I know how to make it work. So what I wanted to do is just duplicate what I'm doing in Kansas City, yeah. but also do it in Florida, yeah. you know, and yeah. so in a place where, and, and so that's what we're doing right now. So like the same guy who does my mailers and all my stuff for Kansas City is now doing it in Florida. Yeah. So like, you know, I want to probably be there in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. You know, and so if I can, if I can pick up five, six projects out there this winter mm -hmm. and be working on those yep. instead of being, instead of being, then you're here, down there, you got something to do. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, that's I the life. I can life. skateboard, I can kite surf, I can surf, I can swim, yeah. I yeah. can, I mean, there's, and I love that life out there. Yes. Yeah. It's always, it's hot. You can, you know, and, and in the winter time, it's 80 degrees, 70 to 80. Yeah. You know, yep. I can, even if there's no waves, I can paddle. I yep. can paddleboard. I can. I, mean, I love the ocean. I was, you know, being born and raised in Hawaii, man. I, I love to surf. I love. I mean, I bet you miss that. I mean, it's so oh, beautiful out there. That'd be tough to live here yeah, after that. Yeah. I mean, I seen a boat out here that had a wave behind it. I was like, "What the hell?" The guy was surfing. I was like, "Let me try." Yeah. So I don't yeah. even know the guy. I just stopped him in the lake, and I was like, "Are you? Is that a surfboard?" He's like, "Yeah." I was like, "What kind of boat is this?" He's like, you want to try? I was like, yeah. So I jumped off our boat and I went on his boat and I got up the first time and I started surfing on this wave and I was like, oh, next day I bought the boat. I was like, shit, I'm buying it. I was like, what kind of boat is it? I was like, okay. I called the guy, the dealer over here. I was like, dude, I need one of these boats that you can surf in Missouri. <laughs> and so that's like the only surfing I get out here is on this damn surf boat. Is it different than a wakeboard boat? It's exactly, it is. It's a wakeboard. So there's three settings. You got um, water ski, wakeboard, and uh, wake surfing. Yeah. And so yeah. it just throws off a wave yeah. on the back of the boat. Yeah. Let me turn this on. It just throws off a wave off the back of the boat.